Proclus himself quoting an external source, and the only extant external source that has what he's quoting is Dionysius. This means Dionysius is the earliest origin of the philosophical thought that would become Neoplatonism. And that totally changes the history of philosophy. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to Telos Bound. Today, I am joined by Craig Trulia and Evangelos. I I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm here with Craig and Evangelos. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, we are here to talk about a very important question, which is the authenticity of the Dionysian corpus. Now, um, I guess... We'll just jump right into it, um, talking about um, the life of St. Dionysius, who he was traditionally understood to be, and then sort of a shift that occurred in modernity with um, all these new scholars and all uh, what seemed to be evidence of the inauthenticity, or at least a lack of evidence of authenticity. So um, just just because you, uh, Evangelist, you just uh, translated um, the life of St. Uh, Dionysius, so uh, I don't think there's anyone better to give us... Um, uh, yeah, and we'll have a link to that book in in the description. It has a the introduction is bigger than the actual book, and it's That's just right. a huge, uh, uh, relatively a, a big defense of the authenticity. Um, easily, from what I understand, the most detailed um, ever done. Um, so it, it is a big privilege to, to have you guys here. So before we jump into it, uh, I just want to thank you guys for uh, for your time and for willing to uh, to join us today. Thank you for having us on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, just for our audience, I guess, um, you, uh, uh, Evangelos, uh, could you introduce us to um, St. Dionysius, who he was, again, who who he was traditionally understood to be by the church, and then sort of give us a timeline for what happened in modernity to mm -hmm. uh, sort of have the shift in an understanding of, of who this man was, or at least who these writings uh, were by. Sure. So the earliest uh, mention we have of St. Dionysius is actually in the Book of Acts. Uh, Act 17, where he appears as the uh, one of the earliest disciples of St. Paul in Athens after he gave his speech on the um, Areopagus, which was a stone outcropping on the western side of the Acropolis, which was where um, you had a high court, essentially the high magistrates of Athens would, would meet to discuss uh, serious uh, cases. Um, and uh, all, all we hear about in the book of Acts about Dionysius is that he was an Areopagite. So that means that he was one of the few men who were part of this elite elite body. Um, it doesn't say much else about him, although we can intuit from the fact that he is named with this title that he was somewhat uh, famous in his city, that he was a person of high standing. Uh, after that, we have a mention in Eusebius quoting Dionysius of Corinth, who was an obscure figure who's not mentioned anywhere else. And in one of his letters, this other Dionysius lived in the second century. He says explicitly that Dionysius, the Areopagite of Athens, was the first bishop of Athens. So he provides us with a bit more information saying that he was actually a bishop. Um, afterwards, uh, there's not much reference to him. Uh, although um, there are these this body of work that's attributed to him, um, there are what I believe are the earliest references are probably in the fourth century by Saint uh, Gregory the Theologian and uh, and Saint Jerome. But I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that later. Um, and, and then Saint, really and the, Saint John Chrysostom. The Saint John Chrysostom, yeah. And then uh, the writings really explode and gain popularity in the uh, uh, early 6th century, uh, where the, they start being quoted a lot in during the uh, Monophysite controversy. Right. And then after that point, they're basically uh, mentioned by every church father in every century. Mm -hmm. um, St. Maximus wrote the commentaries on the corpus, uh, and he obviously thought it was authentic. The corpus is quoted um, in the... Uh, Sixth Ecumenical Council and the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Um, it's brought up by St. Photius. Um, uh, Nikita Stithatos, who was a 
uh, the disciple of St. Simeon, the new theologian, um, St. Gregory Palamas, of course, it's his um, feast day today on the second uh, Sunday of Orthodoxy. So uh, St. Dionysius is one of his main authorities. Uh, and then even in the West, from the moment they were translated in the ninth century by Hildun of Paris, they were accepted uh, as authentic and as uh, great uh, theological works. They're quoted uh, very often by Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and all the way up to the Renaissance, really, that was the, the common reception and perception of, of Dionysius. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once we start getting into the Reformation and the pre-Reformation, uh, that's when doubt started cropping up. The earliest person to pen a... Um, um, refutation, if you will, or a questioning of the authenticity was Lorenzo Valla, who is a, an Italian humanist. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was known for some other uh, heterodox opinions that he had and this sort of revisionist bend to his, his writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and contrary to what people believe, he didn't write a sustained uh, treatise against the authenticity. It was uh, what he did, what he wrote was a literary commentary on the New Testament in Latin, um, following this a new humanist approach to the classics and the patristics. So he wrote this commentary on the Book of Acts. And then in that section where it talks about St. Paul being in Athens and converting St. Dionysius, he has this uh, a page length or, or so where he opines that uh, the works that are attributed to this Dionysius are not really by him. And he gives some arguments. This uh, commentary that he wrote only existed in manuscript form. It was only published later by Erasmus, who basically repeated uh, Lorenzo Valla's arguments and then tacked on a few of his own. And then uh, once the cat was out of the bag, uh, Luther eagerly scooped this up and used this as an argument in his treatise against the Babylonian captivity to dismiss uh, Dionysius. And then using Dionysus basically as a vehicle to attack what he thought were later accretions and corruptions into the church, such as the hierarchy of the priesthood, the sacraments, right. monasticism. Um, and then after the 16th century, there was basically a, a huge debate in Europe between usually writers of a more Protestant inclination would question the authenticity with various arguments. Uh, and then you had the more Catholic writers who would support it. Uh, from what I can tell, there was really no debate in the East at the time. They weren't really concerned with this. Um, although there is there is one author, uh, the 18th century, uh, Evgenios Vulgaris, who was uh, in a footnote, he kind of seems to question it, but he's really basing himself on the Western debates at the time. Right. The Orthodox opinion has always been that the writings were authentic. Uh, and then really the, the next big shift in academia was at the end of the 19th century when there were two articles that appeared by uh, Hugo Koch and Joseph uh, Stiglmeier. One was a, a Jesuit and the other was a, a German classicist. And they were of the opinion that uh, Dionysius was really a Neoplatonist. Uh, Koch, in one of his uh, articles in 1895, uh, right at the end, he's, his, he has this theory that uh, basically the reason Dionysius wrote all this stuff was because he wanted to smuggle Neoplatonism into Christianity. So he dressed it up as this apostolic father and he tricked everyone for uh, 2000 years. Uh, and um, yeah, so they wrote these two articles uh, trying to show Neoplatonist influence in Dionysius. In particular, uh, they wanted to show that Dionysius had plagiarized this work on the subsistence of evils written by Proclus, who was a fifth century Neoplatonist, and that he had uh, lifted these passages and put them in his divine names, chapter four of the divine names. Um, so since then, and in the 20th century, most of the scholarly opinion has, has followed uh, uh, Stiglmeier and Koch's thesis. There have been some lone... Um, lone voices like uh, Father Dimitru Staniloy, who, who until recently uh, questioned uh, the mm -hmm. consensus. Um, but yeah, that's where the, the, the matter stands. Mm -hmm. I know that was a lot of information, but yeah, basically that, that sketches, uh, <clears throat> sketches uh, what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that was that was great. There's a lot to get in in into in 
than that. Um, but but first, uh, I think we should just very quickly um, uh, talk about sort of the stakes for this argument, which, uh, Craig, you wrote a great article on this, um, how, how sort of if, if it's true that Dionysius is um, authentic, uh, it raises serious challenges for Protestants, especially. Um, and I, I, I think it's no coincidence that all of this skepticism surrounding the authenticity of the corpus comes directly from the Reformation era and, and from Reformation thinkers. Um, there seems to be a reason for that. So, uh, Craig, do you want to maybe introduce introduce us to, to that? Yeah, it's and just to comment very briefly, you know, Luther or when it came to Calvin and his skepticism of the Ignatian corpus, they were acting upon which in their day was the cutting edge in scholarship, somewhat fanaticism, but what the best research of their day brought to bear. Mm -hmm. And what we've been finding since um, Renaissance humanism over the centuries, an increasing amount of manuscript finds and even archeological finds that have slowly chipped away at a lot of those time-honored assumptions, um, which actually then bring us back to the traditional view. And so even though there is very good um, scholarship uh, so, uh, opposing into the modern day, opposing the authenticity of the Nicene corpus, what we've been particularly been finding, I'd say the last 10 years has been in the study of language in the study of languages, uh, particularly, um, and the study mm -hmm. of monast studies of monasticism, what we're starting to find is what people were presuming proved the inauthenticity of the Nicene corpus, the newest scholarship showing that's just not true. And so it's, I, I frame it this way to show that it's not that um, Protestants and uh, liberal people of a liberal theological bent, which really comes from Protestantism historically, um, are operating out of bad faith on this question. But presuming we accurately make the case that the corpus is authentic, there's no exaggerating how important this is. It's essentially, even though it's a rediscovery per se, it'd be the most important find since Qumran arguably more important for the Christian because this mm -hmm. is particularly an apostolic father. Um, it'd be, I'd say, as important as a the rediscovery of First Clement in the 19th century to have a source that early and that important on the question. But the topics that Dionysius covers are really much more far ranging because he just wrote so much more than let's say First Clement. And so like, what would we find in the Nicene corpus? If it's authentic, what we have is someone who knew an apostle who has an integrated, explicit view of the energy, energy essence distinction. Now, like we will discuss that. It's not that he's the only person talking about this. It's um, explicitly in paragraphs three to five in the first book of Tuata Lycus um, by uh, St. Theophilus of uh, Antioch. So it's mm -hmm. the energy essence distinction exists in the second century, but it's very integrated and profound in uh, Denisius coverage of it. And it really seems to come from Philo, by the way. Okay. Um, there's discussion, discussions throughout um, ecclesiastical hierarchy of liturgical customs and monasticism. And so even though we could find um, monasticism in uh, sources like St. Hippolytus, because he speaks of nuns and things to that effect. Now we have an explicit Christian source that says there's tonsuring in the first century. And so that's a big deal. And or liturgical customs, the fact that uh, the liturgy is a sacrifice and things that are um, claimed to be early, you know, mid second century developments or something like that, depending on uh, which Protestant apologetics we listen to, um, that becomes untenable once we accept the authenticity of the Nicene corpus. And because we could find things in St. Ignatius, St. Justin Martyr, um, St. Irenaeus on the same note, you start realizing, oh, it's not that we're reading two and two St. Justin Martyr or um, St. Irenaeus or St. Ignatius. It's because this is really um, authentically consistent with what traditionally has been understood, what the point of the liturgy was and what it was functioning to do. Um, now this is taken for granted, but it's important in this day of skepticism, um, 
that Dionysius uh, attests to the uh, canonicity of the book of Revelation. And uh, and this is maybe for Orthodox more of an issue because we don't read the book of Revelation um, liturgically. But this is something that is important where we have uh, such an early source um, seeing the book of Revelation as scripture and quoting it as such. Now, something historically very interesting to me because uh, I'm published in this field is that the Dr. Schumacher and I are the only two scholars I've seen that would take any Dormition sources and and say it's plausible that the earliest of these sources could be dated even to the second century. Well, now we have a early second or late first century source that attests to the Dormition of the Theotokos. So this doesn't become some later accretion, as maybe some apologists may say. This is a very early recorded um, attestation from someone who claims to be an eyewitness who knew the apostles. So if you would make this claim, it would be pretty outrageous if it weren't true, considering who he was writing to, um, St. Timothy, St. Titus, um, St. John, you know, the, you know, the who's who of early Christianity in that day. Um, there is an oblique passage, but there is a passage that directly weighs in Iconodulia, where St. Dionysius speaks of the necessity of representations of uh, divine things, uh, or in other words, icons. So we have a someone who knew the apostles giving a theological rationale of why Iconodulia is a non-negotiable. So in the apologetics landscape, let me like make this less intellectual for a second. Most people are starting to accept, yes, there are pictures. And other people are even accepting, yeah, it, sound, it seems like they really did venerate them. But the real hang-up people have is, but Nicaea too anathematizes people for not venerating the icons. And how could he bind someone's conscience to something that is a negotiable? Well, is it a negotiable if the apostles themselves taught it was a non-negotiable? Well, obviously that wouldn't be the case, right? It would, it would be a non-negotiable in that event. And here we see in Denisia, someone who knew the apostles right to the apostles, taking for granted that Iconodulia was a non-negotiable. So this would give us greater confidence in the teaching I see it too, that yes, this is a matter of dogma and of salvation. And we have now an early source that attests to this in passing because he doesn't write this in a polemical context. There was no debate on icons when Denisius was writing. So it's, it's a, almost a nugget that's relevant to a modern apologetics, you know, debate. But this nugget wasn't like it was planted there because there was some ulterior motive. It just happens to be there in this source. Um, I think the most interesting thing, and, and Evangelos, um, this is authentic, then the origin of Neoplatonism appears to be from the Alexandrian Christian tradition and Denisius himself. Right now you have the history of philosophy dependent upon Christianity. And usually we tend to look at Christianity as this sort of um, backward uh, ideology, backward, having a backward philosophy. And over time, they borrowed profound things from paganism in order to kind of intellectually doll up Christian thought. Well, th now this turns that on its head, right? Because we have the fact that Neoplatonism, Neoplatonist writers like um, Plotinus himself were like classmates with Origen, right? The scholars are coming to grips with that in recent years, that they were learning from the Alexandrian Christian school of philosophy. And if we start seeing exact lexical parallels with Dionysius, in fact, even as uh, we'll get to a little bit, Proclus himself quoting an external source, and the only extant external source that has what he's quoting is Dionysius. This means Dionysius is the earliest origin of the philosophical thought that would become Neoplatonism. And that totally changes the history of philosophy. So this is not, sadly, something that could just be cheapened as apologetic in import. Um, this, this is far-ranging intellectually. But I will say this for those that are interested in apologetics. The, authentic the authenticity that this in corpus pretty much ends all debate with Protestantism. You can't have Protestantism with the Denisian corpus being authentic. It, it's, you could say, well, with Ignatius, you really shouldn't. And arguably, if Calvin thought Ignatius was authentic, to go full circle, he maybe would have not gone as far as he did. 
um, or if you know Luther knew First Clement existed, he might have not went as far as he did. But now, now that we have these things, we have Dionysius, and with the energy essence distinction, a distinction, with the Iconodulia, with the Darmitian, the Theotokos, um, with the liturgical customs, you all of a sudden have no consistent basis to doubt any of the orthodox, um, traditional, centuries-old views of what Christianity is. And I would say, as I said in my blog article that I know that turned you on to this, Trey, um, it's really only the Anglicans can maybe pivot because they could you know, retain the liturgy, they could make it more conservative, they have episcopacy. Maybe they could pivot and alter their theology and incorporate these things. But it seems like everyone else really can and so apologetics wise, it becomes game over. It almost it's to survive, they have to prove the inauthenticity of the Nicene Corpus. And I think what we're gonna find today is they have a massively uphill battle intellectually. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um I, I'm gonna let Nate ask the next question because I I'm, just realized I'm on the wrong Zoom account, so you, you may you may be able to see it. We're running out of time before the recording ends, so I'm gonna. Oh no! I'm I'm buying it right now, <laughs> but Nate's gonna Nate's gonna ask the next question. He's got some good ones. <laughs> yeah, so we kind of understand now what the traditional view of Dionysius is, where things kind of went wrong, and what the stakes really are when we're talking about this kind of stuff, but. I think we should kind of get into what really are the primary issues or concerns that people have when they're looking at the Dionysian corpus and they're saying, there's no way this is authentic. What are the issues that people have with that? And then maybe we can get into some of the specifics of those issues. But first, we should kind of know, for those who aren't that informed about this, who haven't read the book, mm -hmm. what are the concerns that we're addressing here? I mean, I'll say very broadly, because I'll let Evangelos give the details, because he's much more knowledgeable than me. Uh, very, very broadly speaking, one, it's too perfect. It's too early to be this developed, to be this profound, to have all these ideas. It'd be too perfect for us. So it's too good to be true argument. There's, you know, there's a common sense idea to this, but like in isolation, it's not a very strong argument, which is why it always goes back to, I think, Proclus, right? There are just word for word parallels between Dionysius and Proclus. And an issue in all theological scholarship is that somehow the burden of proof is always on Christianity to vindicate itself. That in, in some respects, it's just anything that's Christian, the, the manuscripts can't be um, strong enough. The, uh, the, the writers can't be smart enough to be original of these ideas. They always have to be getting from somewhere. The, the sources we have now can't um, have enough integrity and so there's almost, we take for granted um, that anything that lends plausibility to skepticism um, is more likely than the traditional viewpoint. Now, be that as it may, there's other arguments because as evangelists get into, there's lexical parallels between Dionysius and many other um, early writers, particularly Christian writers coming out of Alexandria. But it's that's the main thing that scholars will focus upon these alleged anachronisms. It's just too perfect to have these things this early. And the very direct parallels with Proclus and the other lexical parallels with other works where they'd say, well, then clearly the Nicius has had to just steal it from everybody. And that's essentially uh, the broad view of why they oppose the authenticity of the Nicene Corpus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add another argument that's been brought up is the lack of explicit witnesses or the um, the few explicit witnesses comparative to some other early fathers. We sort of deconstruct that in the book, um, looking at, you know, uh, is it is it um, unusual if there was a first century Dionysius who wrote these treatises, is it unusual that they would have been not very well known and not very well quoted? And there are historical parallels to this, for example, Athenagoras of Athens, who was another um, erudite uh, second century father from Athens, probably a convert from paganism too, wrote these uh, two long philosophical defenses, one of Christianity, one of the resurrection. And he's not mentioned in Eusebius at all, even though Eusebius uh, talks about, uh, he has whole chapters about the early Christian apologists. Um, 
uh, even a figure like I mentioned earlier, like Dionysius of Corinth, he's not attested uh, anywhere in the whole um, um, patristic tradition. He, uh, if it was not for Eusebius and his uh, brief comments, we wouldn't even know that this person existed. Um, so there is an impression that if the writings were authentic, he would have been quoted more. But uh, that's not necessarily the case because we've lost so many writings and even right. even Dionysus's corpus himself, um, we only have a fragment of what he actually wrote because in the Divine Names, for example, he'll refer to other treatises that he wrote right. as a prequel to the Divine Names and as a sequel that haven't come down to us, uh, which in itself is a, it's a curious thing to include in a forgery, right? Like, why would you write a forgery and then include references and quotes from these putative works that you never actually wrote? So that's sort of an internal clue that seems to be um, a naturalistic element that points to authenticity. He was world building before world building was a thing. And, <laughs> and we're going to, I mean, and, you know, make it light and add some levity to this, but what we're going to find is a lot of the, to make these arguments in favor and authenticity work, we almost have to give Dionysius the forger, right? The alleged pseudo Dionysius. And, knowledge of text criticism that just did not exist when he was alive because mm -hmm. you would almost have to know how text criticism worked in order to perfectly create the sort of lexical parallels and sort of clues and to right. seize upon um i found five different early writings where they they quote an external authority the only extant source for that external authority is dionysius but if it's a forgery, Dionysius would know, hmm, this is a lost work, so I can now take these words, ascribe them to myself, and aha, people think it's quoting me, yeah. right? Yeah. This requires such an attention to detail. Um, it's sort of, I don't know how into you got you guys are into some of the text criticism stuff, but I think it was a scholar named Morden who found Secret Mark. And so um, those who know what secret mark is, I won't bore you, but it's sort of like this uh, extended version of mark with this like quasi odd Gnostic episode in the middle. And so people think secret mark might be earlier than the actual gospel of Mark. But then, you know, one person said, well, knowing what we know about Morden, he was putting little clues. And because he's a text critic, he made it just right. And he's the only person that ever found it. So it's his own forgery. Right. So it's like, even then, if you've read Secret Mark, it is nowhere near the level of Dionysius. And that guy was a text critic who probably made a forgery. Right. And so it's it starts defying all probability that a forger could do this um, simply because no one else was making forgeries like this. Like mm -hmm. uh, one thing hopefully we could discuss is even if let's say it is a forger that get into the details, how in incredible be that it was. There is no forgery that is this genre of literature. What kind of forgeries existed? They're usually written by whomever, making some sort of prophecy um, or some sort of, it's like a hagiographic source, the acts of, you know, the acts of Peter or something like that, right? And so the lend authority to whatever theology or tropes that the person wants to um, talk about, they take an apostle and they use that to grant it authority. But you read Dionysius, it's, it's, it's not a prophecy. It's not a hagiography. It's a, essentially a theological work that takes for granted. If you read the Old Testament, you're going to draw the same conclusions as the author does. It's, there's just no other um, early forgery or pseudographic work remotely like this. It would be a right. genre onto itself. And so that doesn't make it impossible. It just means... All right, if it's a genre unto itself, we have to be very sure the arguments in favor and authenticity work right. because otherwise we're positing a once in a, you know, once in history sort of writer writing a once in history sort of forgery. And you have to have a lot of goods to start positing things like that. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad yeah. you brought that up because um, it... I think even from a secular perspective, you can look at that, like the case you just presented and be like, hmm, but also, especially from an Orthodox or a Catholic perspective or like a traditionally minded Christian perspective, you kind of have to believe, well, you do have to believe that um, this author who was extremely influential on um, theologians in the church and church theology and, and saintly men um, was, was just like created by this 
extremely brilliantly conniving uh like genius who was able to make all these incredibly um incredible forgeries um so yeah just from a orthodox perspective there's kind of a prima facie reason right there um with that context given to um and i mean that's why uh for example our friend sarah from hamilton he has been orthodox for much longer than than me and he's found just by trusting the tradition um you you um, it provides like it, it gives the framework for it, if tradition is true, right, then there is um, uh, you kind of your epistemology needs to align with that truth or else there will probably be some presuppositional problems there uh, anyways. Um, but yeah, so that that's that's great, Craig. Um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about the the scholarly side of things, Evangelos, um, because um, you mentioned that there's this um, very early uh, fragment from another Dionysius, I think only a hundred years after uh, Dionysius the the Areopagite, where he mentions a figure that is Dionysius the Areopagite, and I think I'm not sure if it's with this particular frag fragment, but you mentioned that um, in, in your other interview with with Craig, you you said that um, the the way scholars will work, they kind of have this presupposition now that Dionysius the Areopagite's corpus is inauthentic. So when they see fragments like from the other Dionysius, they automatically just say, oh, that's a, that's a uh, mm -hmm. forgery as well. That's later as well. Um, and then there's a bit of a circular reasoning right there. Well, not not a bit. That's completely circular reasoning. So uh, maybe we could get into a bit of the, well, one, the maybe more into the details of, of um, these early attestations to uh, the Dionysian corpus and also sort of problems with uh, modern scholarly interpretations of it and why something like something is so, so I mean big as a hundred years after Dionysius the Areopagite lived and wrote um, there is a man attesting to to the existence of of the corpus um, yeah I think that's that's uh, quite significant mm -hmm. significant also maybe you um, where could someone find these sources by the way because I'm sure people would want to want to look this up could you just look it up on the internet and, and it, you'll find it uh no mo most of these haven't been translated they're, they're okay quoted gotcha. quoted secondhand in commentaries on the work right uh, the particular one you're mentioning it that's by uh saint maximus's commentary mm -hmm. um since we did the interview back in december we've actually revised a bit of um our view of that fragment because we mm -hmm. came became aware of some scholarship that was contesting that uh, it's still not. I'm not 100 percent convinced. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a bit of a stretch the argument that they provide, but there is a possibility. Um, that's why I'm mentioning it. That it's actually a the fragment in question was by Saint Anastasius of Sinai, that somehow found its way into the commentary of of Saint Maximus under the name of Dionysius. So it's a very complicated manuscript tradition. I won't get into that. Uh, but in light of that, and because we want to really focus on the strongest evidence and the most un uh, uncontestable evidence, I would, I would now not um, rest my case on that fragment alone. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have we don't have early attestation. So, uh, in our book, in that chapter, uh, and this is this has been revised. We've also come out with a second edition of of the book with an extra chapter two on um, early angelology that addresses all this. So. Um, Essentially, if you're looking for the earliest textual attestation, if not by name, but at least a clear um, lexical evidence, uh, it would be in the Alexandrian philosophical school, as, as Craig said. So the earliest author would be someone like Pantanus, um, who uh, lived in the, in the second century. So he's uh, uh, close in, in years to that other Dionysius you mentioned. And... Uh, in a fragment that's preserved by St. Maximus, which this fragment is accepted as authentic by everyone, uh, he uses the same expressions to, to, to talk about how God has knowledge of the world. He says, uh, God knows uh, things, not externally, uh, uh, not as beings, but as his own wills, uh, as his own volitions. Uh, and this is a, a Christian conception of creation because... Uh, a pagan or a Neoplatonist would say that the world is an emanation from the divine substance. There's mm -hmm. no notion of, of will. So uh, it's very interesting that this early Christian uh, uh, philosopher uh, uses these same expressions as Dionysius. And then 
right after him, we have Clement of Alexandria, who's the disciple of uh, Pantanus. And then uh, you find numerous echoes of Dionysius in his writings. Uh, and when I, I speak of echoes, I'm not talking about commonplace expressions like God is infinite and unknowable. These are uh, specific metaphors that you don't find in any other writings. For example, uh, Dionysius in the Divine Names, he he is a very creative and very um, erudite writer. So he'll have these very striking metaphors that he'll use. And one of the metaphors he gives to prayer is uh, um, uh, the idea of a, a chain stretch, stretching from heaven. And uh, imagine pulling on the chain. You can't bring God down to yourself. But what you do is you lift yourself up by pulling the chain. You lift yourself up to God. And then immediately right after, he offers sort of a, a, a similar metaphor of uh, imagine you're a, a man at sea on a ship and you have you cast an anchor and you pull at the anchor. Uh, you're not going to pull the anchor up, but you're really going to just uh, pull your boat and yourself towards the anchor. So it's a similar type of metaphor. Uh, and in fact, the, the first metaphor of the, the, the chain, the luminous chain, uh, it seems to be inspired by uh, Homer. There is uh, uh, in book eight of the Iliad, he uses that metaphor of uh, Zeus casting down a golden chain from heaven. Um, so what's interesting is you have this uh, ancient pagan source. Dionysius seems to take it, Christianizes it, has a uh, a secondary metaphor inspired from the first, uh, the idea of a man at sea. And then in Clement of Alexandria, we find the exact same metaphor of the man at sea with the with the chain and the anchor used in Clement, although he doesn't say where he's getting it from. Hmm. So when you're looking at these texts, uh, you know one uh, one after the other, it's far more probable that Clement took this uh, image, this unique image from Dionysius, uh, given how how um, integrated it is within his 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 writings, than it is to suppose that Dionysius lived after Clement. Uh, scoured Clement's writings, found this, uh, you know, beautiful metaphor, took it, and then reconstructed another metaphor, uh, you know, uh, based on the imagery from the Iliad. Right. Um, so it's these. This is the sort of level of analysis that we have to do. And but when you do this close textual analysis, you find that there are, are many early sources, uh, origin to, uh, and Plotinus uh, that have these lexical parallels. And if I could, if I could add one thing, it's interesting. Like with the disciples of uh, Pan, uh, Panteus, or um, with uh, Origen, or uh, and um, Plotinus, you'll get literal verbatim uh, lexical parallels where it's the same words are used. But with other early writers, say like Clement Alexander, you don't get the exact lexical parallels, but you get the conceptual parallels, and so. Mm. If we have a plagiarizer, we would presume the method of plagiarism would be essentially the same across the board. You'd be just taking words from this writing, words from that writing, and then ascribing them all to himself. You wouldn't take from one writer word for word, and then the next writer just ideas and, paraphr and paraphrase, and then from the next writer word for word, and then the writer after that paraphrase them. Um, and the reason why that's unlikely, because it's more likely that the writers that are borrowing from Dionysius would have their own peculiar methodologies themselves. So uh, the disciples of Panteus might be, you know, just quoting word for word, while let's say Clement of Alexandria just goes by what he's read before, and he's he's not uh, slavishly opening a book in front of him and writing exactly what he sees there, um, while Plotinus. Uh, might be doing precisely that and opening up a, a book in front of them, writing word for word what's there. So it's very peculiar if it's a forgery that the methodology changes, but it wouldn't be peculiar if the people borrowing from Dionysius, according to their own uh, style, paraphrase or quote word for word. And so this is something that would be so high level, again, only a modern text critic would even begin thinking in these terms to make such a convincing forgery, to create such an inconsistency in the methodology so that way you can pick up on it. Without pausing that, you could say, well, you know, um, 
Plotinus wrote one way, Clement Alexander wrote the other way. And, and, and that would be the answer. It'd be Occam's razor. It'd be, that's the answer. That's much simpler. Right, right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I, I, I think maybe then we should get more into um, the, the, the terminology that we find mm -hmm. in, um, in the corpus. And, um, but what, yeah, because, I mean, there are arguments from scholars that actually the, not, yeah, the terminology, of course, but also the, just the, the level sort of, of philosophical uh, brilliance that Dionysius had. And if we're taking the authenticity um, argument, um, if, if we're taking that position, um, it means that as Craig was saying in, in his, um, one of his earlier um, statements is about like how this, how much this changes for the history of philosophy as well. Cause it shows that actually these Neoplatonists took from, from Dionysius Um and uh, yeah, so I was wondering, uh, what are some like specific examples of terms? Let, let's go with terms uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, but you can add anything else that Dionysius uses that would um, uh, point to uh, authenticity. I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's John Parker who said this. Um, uh, someone said this that um, actually it was Seraphim. It was Seraphim Hamilton pointed out that um, uh, oftentimes Dionysius will will refer refer to our Lord as Jesus, just, just with the single name Jesus. And, um, that was quite rare, um, later in church history, but actually, um, according to Sarah, I haven't looked into this, but this was uh, a way, um, uh, Christ would be referred to early on. Um, ha have you heard of that argument before? And what are, what are some other examples of, of early, uh, terminology in, in the corpus? Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't thought of that, but mm -hmm. that, that seems uh, that seems accurate. Um, off the top of my head, one uh, major term would be the word therapeute, um, therapeutis, yeah. which he uses to refer to monks. Uh, that's only tested in another first century source, Philo, mm -hmm. who describes this early sort of proto monastic uh, group. Um, so it's a very striking that you have this putative first century source used, just happens to use the same word that's used by Philo. But I would go one step further. It's not that Dionysius uses the word. It's his conception of monasticism is chronologically accurate. It's not anachronistic. Because if he was writing in the 5th century, he would have lived after the time of St. Anthony and all these great monastic saints. So his conception of monast the monastic life would have arguably been modeled on that. But he was such a perceptive forger that he knew how the early Christian monks actually lived. And from the life of St. Anthony, we know that um, it says that when Anthony was a young man, uh, there were not yet many monasteries in Egypt, as his life says, but uh, all those who wanted to live the monastic life did so in solitude near their own villages. So they weren't ascetics out in the desert. They were a part of the Christian community. They were part of the church uh, and uh, you would see them, I suppose, in the local parishes, but they were a, a class apart. They lived a separate type of life. Uh, and this is reflected in Dionysius. Um, and, and, Dionysius and, and on that note, yeah. uh, on therapy, before we change the subject, it's the term therapy, it's not just in Philo. It's he, Philo draws the connection between um, monasticism and therapy and God being a monad. And those exact words are used by Dionysius. And so why is this relevant? Someone could say, well, Dionysius could have ripped off Philo. And the chances are that's very high, actually. But the mainstream scholarly view is that, um, in reality, um, that pseudo-Dionysius was um, cripping from Evagrius and then later Syrian spirituality. Um, and so you find, well, if we have exact lexical parallels about monasticism with Philo, we don't need to look at sources centuries later, especially when those are just alleged conceptual similarities, which is even then a bit of a stretch, when we have both conceptual and exact lexical similarities with a first century source. I mean, again, Occam's razor, that makes much more sense. Yeah. Um, and there's a scholar named uh, Miros Nikov, and... He's done really good work, I think, in the last seven years. So this is pretty recent um, on the early Targums, early Greek translation, the scriptures. He even finds in Clement of Alexandria and the Gospel of Thomas um, references to holy men um, using the same Greek term for monk. 
So you could find this in the early Greek translations of the scriptures and in the Targums and whatnot, and even traces which Aramaic word they're getting this Greek word from. And so this shows that the whole um, paradigm of monasticism isn't something that we need to go to Syria in the fourth, fifth century um, in order to locate because the, the, the best, most recent scholarship is showing that, no, this existed in Judaism at the turn of the first century and in early Christianity. And we have um, lexical reasons for this, stronger lexical reasons, because there's exact lexical parallels, then find that this is a Greek, you know, um, a, a Greek retro version of some sort of, a Syri of Syriac ideas and Syriac terms. Um, like we see in uh, Archbishop Alexander Galitzin's research. So this, this is something where um, you find that this is from the first century and the best, most compelling scholarship is making this abundantly clear now. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I didn't know if you're gonna about to go there, Evangelist, but I didn't want to leave that uh, aside if we were about to- Yeah, that's perfect. Proof. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's just generally, um, I guess our, our point is that uh, not only does he use words that are chronologically accurate, but he has an intimate awareness of the concepts that would have been associated with those words, which is very unlikely for a later forger. Mm -hmm. um, another example, actually, this occurred to me today at church because we were reading from Hebrews, and uh, in Hebrews uh, 1.14, um, St. Paul says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth uh, to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So uh, why I bring this up is because the word for he uses for ministering spirits are liturgica, which is the uh, source of the uh, word uh, liturgy. And he said they are sent to uh, sent forth to minister. So in English, the King James uses the both words, but in Greek, it's actually viakonian, which is where we get the word for deacons. And uh, why this is, uh, struck me is because uh, Dionysius doesn't refer to deacons as deacons, diaconi. He refers to them as uh, attendants, liturgi. And uh, so it's another interesting detail. Why, why would he just create this alternative name for deacons that's not attested anywhere else? Um, and then here in, in Hebrews, we have St. Paul referring to the angels as deacons, ministering, using the word uh, liturgist that that Dionysus uses. Hmm. Uh, yeah, a little aside. It makes now. sense if he got it from St. Paul, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? It, it, it makes sense. It's, I mean, there's stuff in the first century that's just like, you know, outrageous. Because like, for example, um, Dionysius takes issue with a philosopher named Clements. It's where we get the Clementine uh, literature from. And... Scholarship goes like back and forth how early we could date certain fragments of it. And, uh, but I would just point out, it's just interesting if some of the scholarship that does date the earliest parts of the Clementine literature of the first century is accurate, that we have a contemporary taking issue with another contemporary. And uh, the interesting thing is they're arguing over divine simplicity, Denisius defending divine simplicity. And um, in so doing, Denisius is arguing that this is necessary um, in order to properly understand how God's divine energies work in the world and his divine will. Um, and not to bore you guys, but, you know, that comes from like platonic metaphysics of, you know, the, uh, energy and will coming from essence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clemens kind of defends this more Jewish idea that God could have a compound essence, essentially, and not simple but still his divine energies, you know, would be able to permeate all of existence. He uses the example of the sun being right, being a substance and having a, a, a certain amount of space, but the rays of the sun allegedly, you know, permeate the whole universe. And so, right, God would be the analog to the sun in this. So you have this literal energy essence distinction debate from the first century right, between um, Clemens and Dionysius and the debates over whether or not this necessitates God being simple or not, mm -hmm. right? right? So it's it's a very precise argument. It's not concerned with any later ideas. And the interesting thing is Dionysius is only interested in Clemens' view, this, this um, 
this view of a compound God that really kind of peters out mostly. We could get into more detail, but I'll leave that here for now. Pretty much peters out by the end of the second century. You know, maybe Melito of Sardis had this idea and after him it goes away. Um, it's a very interesting thing for a later forger to, to really be that invested in this and in that sort of detail. But the people that were actually arguing about it were arguing about the same thing uh, with, again, the results of what does it mean for the divine energies depending upon whether God's essence is, is simple or not. Right. It's, it's a very interesting debate. And those are the only two excellent sources we have that are actually arguing precisely on that point. Um, another thing that I think really ties very nicely into the first century is that St. Dionysius takes issue with, uh, with uh, Simon Magnus. And in so doing, he makes this criticism about um, the manifest and the hidden. And um, those two terms apparently were part of the proto-Gnostic theology of Simon Magnus, and we know this from St. Hippolytus. So that's a pretty early source recording what this Gnostic theology taught. And so in giving the critique of Simon Magnus, we see Dionysius using the words manifest and hidden in a sort of wordplay. He uses the word invisible in this uh, sort of wordplay to turn what Simon Magnus's ideas were on their head. And so this sort of like ironic critique from where the only way you could put together this ironic critique if you're a forger is to, to look at this obscure passage in Hippolytus, a refutation of all heresies about the idea. Um, it seems like, wow, that's a lot of effort to make this ironic critique, which to get the kind of subtle dig in makes more sense for a contemporary that would be more viscerally offended by the idea and the people with the idea than so in centuries later where there, there's no more Simonist anymore that, that espouse these ideas about the manifest and the, uh, and the hidden. So it's again, a, another very interesting idea, but um, something I know much less about um, is just the lexical stuff from uh, uh, Nicolo Sassi and uh, the Attic Greek verbiage that makes sense in the first century but wouldn't make sense in later centuries i don't know if uh evangelist you could get to a little more detail like just like the eternal vocabulary denisius and why that fits in the first century yeah absolutely um i just want to preface that by saying uh, a lot of times when people are uh, attacking the corpus i find they're using the wrong methodological tools oftentimes when people will approach this debate they're going to look at it in a strictly philosophical perspective, saying, mm -hmm. what, what are the ideas of Dionysius? What were the ideas of Platonism? Okay, there's some vague similarity, therefore it must have come from there. But I, I think that's completely the wrong way to go about it. When we're looking at ancient texts, we really have to look at, uh, you know, what, are the, what is the language? What are the, the sources, the references, the uh, reception, right? We have to use philology, not philosophy, um, when, when, when treating the subject, even though philosophy informs informs philology too. So um, I, so I personally believe in light of that, uh, just the, the style of Dionysius is unforgeable. Anyone who, who knows Greek and reads his writings, uh, it's, it's clear that no one in the fifth century could have written this. He uses uh, excre extremely learned vocabulary, impeccable grammar, uh, specifically Attic grammar, uh, which um, people might know there were different dialects of, of ancient Greek and Attic was the, the dialect of Athens and it was associated with a very learned, pr pr uh, prestigious style. Um, so he uses all these words, like I, I mentioned before, he has allusions to Homer. Um, he seems to have read Aristotle, it seems. Um, in, some past, in some parts, he seems to quote Plato because he or sh he shows familiarity with these uh, the educated sort of philosophical terminology of the pagan schools uh, in a historically um, in a chronologically uh, astute sense meaning he's not he's not quoting later terms that aren't attested everything he he all the terms he uses are, are first and second century terms and uh, actually something I was we do touch on the book, but I was delving more deeply into this week. Uh, 
was uh, the general style of Dionysius. Uh, because as Craig said, the, uh, one of the objections is that the, the writings are just too complex. People didn't write like this back in the first century. But th this is a, a misconception, I believe. Uh, the idea that we think that the to be apostolic needs to be, you know, just very simple. It has to be like the Gospels, very laconic, short sentences. Um, if Dionysius uh, is who he says he is, according to the historical tradition, he was a high magistrate of Athens, so he would have been a very educated person. Uh, if this person did write in Greek, well, his writings would look something like this, we imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, something people, uh, people don't know is um, between 60 AD and 230 AD, so from the time of Nero to about the early 3rd century, uh, there was this style of rhetoric uh, called the Second Sophistic. And uh, the, the, the sophists were educated uh, men who served as lawyers or, or orators. And uh, they used this very flowery, ornate, attic style uh, that's been studied. It's, it's, uh, most of the research was done in the 19th century, sort of fallen out of vogue, but uh, it was a, a style unto itself. And one of the schools of this second sophistic uh, style was called the Asianic School. And the characteristics of this type of oratory was a lot of repetition, parallelism, wordplay, uh, even rhyme. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I was reading about this recently. And after when I looked at Dionysius, all these elements that were there just started jumping off the page to me because these are precisely the techniques that, that he uses. Uh, repetition, wordplay, uh, these very convoluted sentences and syntax so the, the very point that makes people think these writings are inauthentic because they're seemingly too complex, too elaborate, that, that's actually the best argument for their authenticity because that's precisely how an educated first century uh, uh, order philosopher would have written. <laughs> and for someone right. in the fifth century to imitate the style of the second sophistic, which was obsolete, to use perfect Attic grammar, to invent words that aren't attested in the the rest of the entire extant Greek corpus uh, to show this type of literary genius uh, and to do it all in this consistent style, which is very unself-referential, right? Dionysius never really refers to himself. He always kind of quotes other authorities. Uh, you know, you would, you're talking about a level of forgery that is just beyond anything that's ever been done. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's very important. And, and uh, I think a big problem in this is it's kind of hard for people that don't do that much scholarship or read that much scholarship, but to be a scholar, you have to be a specialist, right? It's, it's not the Renaissance where like someone knows a little bit about everything. Um, we're hyper specialized in academia. There's few people that are broadly experts on a lot of things. And so what happens is you have someone that's just a philology expert, someone right. who's just a philosophy expert, someone who's just a fifth century Syrian history expert. And so you start missing the forest from the trees as a result of that. And so like we see not only those philological arguments, but what I find of so much that is missed in the research of Christianity is a cross-disciplinary approach, particularly with Judaism, which you think would be an obvious avenue of researching some of these things, meaning that Christianity came from Judaism, but they almost don't read each other's scholarship at all. Um, right. It's getting more popular in recent years, but like, for example, you'll read, and I think in, correct me if I'm wrong, Avengers, I think it's uh, Dr. Uh, Rose, uh, Rosemary Arthur, Arthur, who, who says that the hierarchical view of angels is originist and it's from the sixth century. And that's why mm -hmm. we could um, date the Denisian corpus to the sixth century. But it's like, if let alone reading, like being a specialist, which you could do yourselves to your audience by just going to newadvent.com and reading the apostolic fathers. I mean, St. Ignatius of Antioch speaks of ranks and the array of principalities. The, the Ascension of Isaiah has obvious angelic hierarchy. That's pretty much the whole construction of the heavens is an angelic hierarchy. Um, we even have an angelic liturgy in Qumran, which is very explicitly hierarchical. In fact, I think that a Qumranic uh, liturgy 
comes closest out of all the ancient sources to what we're seeing in Dionysius. And uh, so what you start seeing here is this hierarchical view of angels, which though you'll get kind of like these passing statements and all the fathers, you know, they, they talk about angels because they're getting in from, I think, Ephesians chapter four. Um, but that being said, it's this sort of focused concern on the hierarchy of angels is found more in the first and second centuries. Hmm. Um, and ironically, it's, this is when the Dionysian corpus supposedly comes from. And so like deposit, it comes from centuries later and not from the era where these things are particularly acute in the writings of uh, Jews and Christians um, seems to me a very big stretch. But again, if you're not a specialist to say in Quran, you would, you just wouldn't even know about this. Right. And so um, I, I, again, a lot of the issue is not, having a cross disciplinary approach and researching these issues. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually, that's a big problem um, with a lot of different topics. It's funny how like uh, evangelist says Dionysius isn't a very self-referential writer, but scholar scholarly fields typically are pretty self-referential. And one example is how in modern anthropology, this really this popular what, what is now a popular idea of the development of religion from animism to polytheism to monotheism this is sort of that at least that simple model is rejected by a lot of anthropologists today and this is sort of a, a more recent thing relatively but that those new developments haven't necessarily tr um, b been translated or um, shared with other fields for example biblical studies where you still have biblical scholars who take this presuppositional presupposition that there was this animism to polytheism and then monotheism and then they obviously read it into the biblical text and it gets you into problems there so that yeah that's a really big sort of epistemological problem um now one thing i wanted to to, to talk about um because this is something that i think it's actually father andrew uh louth who who brings this up uh this this um argument against the authenticity or or a, a point against it is um uh, you were talking about the complexity of his work, um, but this isn't. This is like um, th this is like the theological complexity that that I want to talk about um, in terms, uh, specifically in terms of his apophaticism and his understanding of apophatic theology, which. Mm -hmm. um, at least from what I can tell, um, there is not as developed of a view of apophatic theology. Um, at, definitely not as early as as Dionysius. Um, so what would what would basically account for this? What or or am I wrong here? Are there other um, examples of this sort of highly developed understanding of apathetic theology that um, is basically? I mean, we understand this now. It's it's easy to to be twenty first century Orthodox Christians and just take this for granted. Um, but I don't I don't I don't see as developed of a view in the early in the early fathers. Um, so what would, what would account for that? And also what would account for, um, yeah, what would account for them not, not, um, uh, not being at Dionysius's level? Um, and I think one possible answer is just the complexity of it, as you were, you were saying. And I think this may, um, uh, I, I also wanted to talk about this, like reasons for why he, he is relatively, um, even though not, um, uniquely but relatively uh, there's um very few um attestations early attestations to the to the corpus um and i think uh, a possible reason could one be the complexity of it like the, the average yeah. person is not going to read even the av average bishop isn't necessar necessarily going to understand this um and um and then also uh the the i think uh dionysius didn't seem to have a i, I i'm not sure but um uh his writings aren't the central focus of his writings aren't on refuting heresies, and it seems like the most documents we have that were the most translated and spread around had to do with heresies. And and I mean, like that's when you have this explosion of uh, of attestations to the corpus around the sixth century um, with with the Monophysites who sort of took them as, as their guy. Um, so that was a that was a few different questions there. The first one was um, why the developed apophatic theology, and why don't we see this in the other early fathers or do we and then um what could be the the reasons for why um for why he he was relatively it seems um unattested to um not completely of course but compared to other fathers especially 
Let me give broadly the answer, and I'll, I'll let Evangelos back clean it up and not get, not get the runs all the details. The Aristides okay. apology actually gets into all this stuff. There, and you know, he asserts that um, God is indeed unsearchable in his nature. He's incomprehensible. He even says he has no name, which is something we see hmm. in, in Dionysius. Um, we also, I think, it's not so much Dionysius Christianized Proclus. I think, and this is something where maybe. Um, Evangelist and I disagree. I think Dionysius Christianized Philo because we see this stuff in detail in Philo all over the place. And so it would actually be incorrect to say that we cannot find these sort of mm -hmm. theological concerns that early because they are that early. Someone right. in Athens with Aristides, very close to uh, Dionysius, and with Philo, as I've already started laying the basis for, where there are uh, lexical um dependence upon philo and so it, it does make sense that um these ideas then did have traction during this era so this then begs the bigger question why wasn't this more common but one we we can't think of this anachronistically it's too perfect for us today right because it, it would have import with protestantism and, and modern polemical concerns even energy essence distinction to orthodox from catholics but think of you living in the second third and fourth century what theological debate existed where quoting Dionysius would have helped settle issues for you? Really not many. Yeah. And as you already pointed out, who are the people that would have been reading this that could have really even grasped it all that much? Uh, not a lot of people. And so what you interestingly see is the strongest lexical dependence is all with Alexandrian writers. And a good case could be made that starting with, um, my brain's not working for a moment. Who's that philosopher uh, in Athens? I'm sorry? Athenagoras. Oh, uh, Athenagoras. Yeah. So, so Athenagoras brought the Denisian corpus with them to Alexandria, and essentially it was just there until it probably made the Constantinople by the 4th century because it's quoted by Jerome when he was in Constantinople mm. and uh, mm. or cited by Jerome in Constantinople and, and right. quoted by Gregory Nazianzus in Constantinople. And so you kind of then have the answer, why weren't there more manuscripts? Because just like First Clement is exists for us today in a single manuscript, there's really nothing crazy about this really obscure body of works where not a lot of people really want to read it, other than like the really dorkiest, smartest intellectuals like Origin and stuff. And they're all in Alexandria, and that's where you gotta go if you want right. to read this thing. Right. And so I think that essentially answers the question. It was essentially yeah. just in Alexandria, it was not a popular work. Right. And um, and it's only later during Chalcedon that because Dionysius makes kind of these obscure passing observations that have import on Chalcedonian debates that people from all sides think that Dionysius is on their side. And so then everyone finds him as their man, not just the Miaphysites, but the Nestorians and the Chalcedonians as well. So everyone right. finds Dionysius as their man, and that's what gives it the popularity, because finally there's a theological debate where people need something that is on their side, and sources with the same Chalcedonian distinctives um, that use the same sort of vocabulary, for example, like St. Hippolytus, they're too short and fragmentary where they would elicit the same sort of popular acceptance that then the Dionysian corpus did. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that kind of really explains why it's yeah. uh, it was pretty much just in Alexandria right. at some point made the Constantinople, but even then it's like only guys like Gregory Nazianzus. I mean, the, the highest of intellectuals mm -hmm. were really seriously interacting um, with this text, but it's, it's interesting to point out that, you know, this text is quoted um, or cited as an external authority. So it's not just like he uses the same words. Like mm. they say, somewhere says this, or someone says this. So they're quoting someone mm -hmm. um, by Proclus. Gregory Nazianzus does it twice. Um, Jerome. And now that we accept all this, we have a fragment from Cyril of Alexander the same, which again, most scholars right. say, well, that's a, you know, that's a forgery from one century after Cyril of Alexander existed. Mm -hmm. But if we don't accept that the right, the this is unauthentic, that becomes yet another proof of an early attestation of its existence. I will say this on this note, though, if you notice, it all starts in the late fourth century. 
And there seems to be this sort of reticence to quote Dionysius of Alexandria by name. Hmm. Um, Dionysius of Athens, rather, this stereotype by name. Hmm. And so this begs the question, why? Did someone like St. Jerome think maybe it was a forgery, but like maybe a third century forgery? Um, that opens another can of worms. But we do know that by the fourth century, there's no doubt that this body of text existed and it was in Alexandria. There could be right. no doubt about yeah. that. The question then becomes what probability wise is the cause of its origin? A really astute, unknown third or fourth century yeah. forger, um, or is it authentic? Right. I'll, I'll just say before Evangelos or, or anyone else. Um, the the focus on uh like the point you made about it being in alexandria basically exclusively it seems is really important because one of the problems i had was sort of reconciling the idea of authenticity with the actual historical reality because a lot of people would say oh um the the corpus the reason why you you find well before it was people would say zero attestations before the sixth century is because um it, it, it was just kept in very tight-knit christian circles um but then i mean that just doesn't answer that's not consistent with the fact that pagan philosophers had access to it but if we're um if we're instead making the argument not that it was just kept in in tight christian circles but specifically in alexandria itself then it makes complete sense because all of these philosophers are either from alexandria itself or very very connected to it the same with jerome and i believe spend, he, yeah. He's, yeah yeah they spent connected. significant time there right? yeah. you know like with Plotinus and stuff, then Proclus, they were in mm -hmm. Alexandria. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's, that explains where, how they had access to it. Right, right. Now, uh, for Evangelos, um, I wanted to focus specifically in on, on this question, but also sort of the, the apophaticism aspect yeah. of it. The, it, it he, re, Dionysius, I mean, even just, uh, it, He's a unique writer just in general, right? It's not just for his time. Um, whatever period you would want to link him to, um, he's unique. Um, so is it just like, is the answer to the question? Well, I, I mean, Craig's take, I think, is he borrows a lot from Philo. Um, uh, I'm not sure how you feel about that, Evangelos, but um, like, is it just like, do we have to just lay a lot of the explanation on just the unique uniqueness of Dionysius's mind when it comes to the develop, developed theology he, he has? Uh, there's certainly some originality to his thought, but I would say that everything he, he talks about is uh, very well attested biblically and in the first and second centuries. So mm -hmm. just to get to the, the meat of, of apophaticism. So I would contest what Louth says if you go to the uh, Wisdom of uh, Sirach, uh, chapter 43, uh, sorry, let me get this for you, verse 27 to 33. So, <clears throat> we may speak much and yet come short, wherefore in some he, that is God, is all. How shall we be able to magnify him? For he is great above all his works. The Lord is terrible and very great and marvelous is his power. When ye glorify the Lord, exalt him as much as ye can. For even yet will he far exceed. And when ye exalt him, put forth all your strength and be not weary, for ye can never go far enough. Who hath seen him that he might tell us and who can magnify him as he is? Uh, so this is from uh, dated to the first century BC. Uh, and this is a, it's a clear uh, distinction between what God is. No one has seen him. You can never exalt him um, enough. And how God is known by his his dynamis, his, his power and his works. Yep. Yep. And this is a consistent theme you have uh, going back to Exodus when Moses goes up to the, uh, to, the, to the mount to receive the Ten Commandments and he is enveloped in the divine gloom and uh, he cannot see God's face. Right. And we have all these metaphors in Psalm 18 that uh, God hath made his abode in darkness. So there's a... a you know, Judaism is an apophatic religion. There's no, right, right. there's no question about it. That's but, what that's what distinguished it from yeah. paganism. Before you continue, I just want to point out for for our audience mostly, um, you mentioned the term dynamis. Now, yeah, the problem with this term, which is something T. Campino points out, great great Palamite scholar, um, he he points out that. One of the translation problems from Greek to English is that dynamis is often translated as potentiality. And the mm -hmm. term energeia is is basically taken by Palamas from Aristotle. Um, and this is 
uh, Dr. David Bradshaw's work. And it's not just Palamas to Aristotle, there's like a lineage there, but um, energeia means actuality. So if you are taking these English translations and the Aristotelian connotations to these English translations, um, you may see the term dynamis and think it's literally the opposite of energeia, while for Palamas, he basically uses dynamis um, just as much as the term energeia, if not more, um, to, to refer to the divine energy or the divine energies. So that's just mm -hmm. something I'd, I'd point out for, for the audience. This term dynamis is yeah. the, the term, um, uh, it does mean um, energy. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if you, you wanted to f finish... Um, I, I yeah, I had some other uh, yeah, quotes sure. too. Um, yeah, and that's a good point uh, because Dionysius too uses uh, dynamis interchangeably with uh, energia, and he also he refers to the the, mm. the energies in, in a variety of ways. He calls them uh, gifts, Wills, grace, volitions. processions. Yeah. Uh, yes, but a yeah. bunch of a bunch of terms. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a wide variety of vocabulary. Uh, but this is also uh, if people don't want to trust uh, me. They could go read this one Italian scholar, Cristina Termini. She wrote a whole book on Philo and this doctrine of Vinamis in Philo and in Hellenistic mm. Judaism. And she really shows how this was a consistent uh, doctrine. Uh, for example, you have also in Josephus. So he's, uh, you can't really accuse Josephus of being a Platonist, right? Uh, he was uh, from a priestly, <laughs> priestly family. Uh, so he says, and this is uh, against um, Apian, book two, uh, section 17. Uh, and, and this is, you know, uh, Josephus's apology of his religion. So it's not a creative theological work. He's stating what the tradition of the Jews, what they believe. And he says, God is known to us by his power, Vinami, yet unknown to us as to his essence. And the word he uses is katusian, essence, right? So, you know. This looks just like something you'd find in <laughs> Palamas, but it's by Josephus. Um, so that, that's in the Jewish tradition. Uh, Philo, as as Craig said, he's very much talks about this. He even uses the same metaphor of the divine gloom as Dionysius. Uh, but in on the Christian side, we have uh, Justin Martyr. So he, Justin says, and no one can utter the name of the ineffable God, uh, for by whatever name he be called, um he has his elder the person who gives him the name but these words father god creator lord master are not names but appellations derived from his good deeds and functions so essentially what he's saying is that when we got uh, called god creator we're not uh defining his essence we're defining a specific energy that he has vis-a-vis -vis creation uh you find the same in uh, St. Irenaeus against heresies, book 4, chapter 20, when he says, none of the prophets saw God, but what they had beheld were similitudes, figures, characters, disposition, and dispensations of his glory. Uh, and actually, this chapter of Irenaeus, book 4, chapter 20, it's the closest parallel, really, to we have to the divine names. Because what Irenaeus does there is that he looks at all the different theophanies of God in the Old and New Testament, and the different names he's called, uh, like the the Son of Man, uh, the Ancient of Days, the Lamb, the un the self hewn uh, stone, which is interestingly the same one of the the names of God that Dionysius investigates. So he he collects these uh, energies of God, if you will, these manifestations, and then he says quite clearly, but none of the prophets actually saw God, meaning his essence. What they saw were these uh, similitudes and and figures of his glory. Uh, so in short, this this chapter of, of Saint Irenaeus, a, a second century father, is uh, is very close uh, thematically to the divine names. Uh, as Craig alluded to before, we have Saint Theophilus of Antioch. Uh, it talks about this in two Autolycus, Book One, Chapter Three, Clement of Alexandria, uh, Tertullian, even in Against Praxis, he says God is invisible like the sun but he cannot be seen in the full amount of his substance. Uh, and this is the same metaphor that Dionysius uses, that God is just so bright, you cannot see him in his, in his, uh, in his essence because he is uh, super luminous is the way he uses. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if anything, it's, it's the opposite. Uh, the divine, the uh, essence energy distinction is, is so 
early in Christianity and so Jewish that the fact that we find right. it in such a pronounced form in Dionysius is another uh, point in its in its favor. Right, and and yeah, before... a, if if it peters out in the later third century and early fourth century, you know, and it kind of says it kind of makes you say, all right, we know the we know this was um, written sometime between the late fourth century. Then what era fits the best? And he, you know, get back to the era which Dionysius is actually from, where most of these things are coalescing in the sources. Right. And if, if I may just add one one last thing on this point, um, because there's really this popular misconception about er this mysticism of Dionysius is platonic, but it's it's really not. Just listen to his own words, where he says he's getting this doctrine. So this is a letter five of Dionysius to the Rothius, and he says it's a short letter. Uh, the divine gloom is the unapproachable light in which God is said to dwell. So that's a quote from 1 Timothy. In this gloom, invisible the, indeed on account of the surpassing brightness, and unapproachable on account of the excess of the super essential stream of light, enters everyone deemed worthy to know and to see God. Uh, and then he continues and he says, uh, in, in the words of the prophet, thy knowledge was regarded as wonderful by me, it was confirmed, I can by no means attain unto it. And that is from uh, Psalm 139. So the prophet being uh, King David. And then he continues, even as the divine Paul is said to have known Almighty God, by having known him as being above all conception knowledge. Wherefore he says, quote, his ways are past finding out and his judgments inscrutable. That's from uh, Romans. His gifts are indescribable. That's from Second Corinthians. And his peace surpasses, and the word in Greek surpasses, it, it, it's iperechi, uh, transcends, uh, which is the same word that's used in the later Neoplatonic circles, but it's in the Bible. The peace surpasses every mind, and uh, he is above all conception. So uh, literally everything that Dionysius says, he, 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 he himself claims he took it from the scriptures, and we could attest that it is in the scriptures. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to, I was going to make, a, uh, uh, I was going to ask a question, but I think Nate's, I'll ask mine after Nate's because I think it's, we need to get into uh, sort of a more of a deep dive into the Neoplatonism stuff in particular, because this is the big sort of thing. This is um, yeah. the, the parallels specifically between Dionysius and Proclus. This is sort of the, this is um, really the key, the hinge around which uh, I would say the main argument uh, against authenticity sort of revolves around um, because there is just an undeniable connection there. Um, um, but I get, the question is, which way does it go? Um, so I'll let Nate in introduce that, that that question. Yeah, so Craig, you were kind of saying earlier about how Christianity is always pushed onto the defense, but I think we've done a pretty good job on the defensive side of things. We've kind of proved that Dionysius isn't necessarily dependent on these external pagan sources. So now let's go on the offense and let's kind of demonstrate how does this view fit into the history of philosophy? How do we see Dis Dionysius inspiring the Neoplatonic writers, especially because he didn't seem to be necessarily that influential on early Christian writers. So how do we see him? How do we see these Neoplatonic circles getting access to him at a degree that seems so much higher than early Christian writers? And and also, what if there is any evidence within these Neoplatonic writings themselves of dependence upon upon Dionysius? Yeah. This is, and, I'll just say very broadly, and I'll pass it to Evangelos, is the issue is it's not Greek philosophers or philosophers in general throughout all the Mediterranean world. It's philosophers connected to Alexandria. Alexandria. And this and this really frames issues that to Alexandrian writers, pagan and Christian, then this is as important, right? Everyone who's a who's who from Alexandria or having studied Alexandria is aware of Dionysius. And so... It's not that, oh, why didn't the Christians not appreciate, but the pagans did. And then, like, right, and if the pagans just did, maybe it's because it's a forger that borrowed from the pagans. It actually, it's the wrong framing. It's 
that's why everyone who came from the Alexandrian school, uh, Christian school, is concerned with Dionysius because apparently he must have been some sort of like, if you're the PhD student there, to use a anarchism, you had to read Dionysius and, and be aware of what he taught. Um, and so I'll let Evangelists get into the details of exactly how this is threaded into Neoplatonism. But that's how the Neoplatonists were exposed to Dionysius. And then the question then is, what did they do with Dionysius in making their own philosophy, essentially paganizing Christian philosophy, not the other way around? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would um, I would say regard in regard to Proclus, uh, firstly, if the two earlier attestations of St. Gregory and Jerome in the 4th century are, uh, are accurate and they are indeed referring to um, Dionysius, then all the argument that Proclus was the source of Dionysius dies on the vine because we have uh, writings uh, 100 years or 50 years before that are attesting to the existence of this corpus. So for those who are interested, it's in our book, but specifically it's St. Gregory, the theologian oration uh, 38, which he delivered in uh, 380 or 381 AD. In section seven, uh, he quotes one of those who came before us with regard to uh, the uh, seraphic hymn being a um, uh, pointing to the tr doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, so this occurs in other writers, it's in Athanasius and some other writers, but the, the uh, lexical parallels in the paragraph immediately preceding and right after this quote to, to this authority uh, in uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Gregory, uh, the only matches that exist are to, to Dionysius. And then coincidentally, the very same year that St. Gregory delivered this uh, homily, St. Jerome happened to be studying under St. Gregory in uh, Constantinople. And he wrote a letter, uh, I believe this is letter 18A, to uh, Pope Damasus of Rome, where he's, uh, they're part of his series called the Exegetical Letters. So he's commenting, commenting on different passages from the scriptures. And he comments on the very same passage that St. Gregory was commentating upon uh, uh, on Isaiah about the seraphic hymn. And he says, um, as one, as a, um, how does it go? Uh, a, a very erudite Greek has said, and then he quotes his interpretation. And uh, there's a line that he says where he says, uh, uh, this educated Greek has, uh, has said, this uh, educated Greek, very learned in the scriptures, has said that the angels are certain powers in the heavens. And that's that's uh, line occurs in the celestial hierarchy, mm. uh, and then his description of the functions of the angels as praising, purifying, and punishing God as 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 punishing mortals on behalf of God. Um, the notion of punishment uh, comes up in the celestial hierarchy again when he quotes Ezekiel uh, sending the angels to punish men. Uh, so this uh, conflux of descriptions and features and vocabulary that St. Gregory or that St. Jerome attributes to this person uh, is only found in the celestial hierarchy. Uh, in the article I was uh, we wrote with Craig, we look at all the other attestations, other uh, com uh, comments on this passage in earlier fathers, for example, Origen or Eusebius of Caesarea. No one has the specific matches that Jerome has in this passage. And I've looked up all the modern editions of Jerome and Gregory, and even the modern editors don't know who he's referring to in this passage. Uh, so it's very interesting that you have this confluence of evidence from these two people writing in two different languages, Latin and Greek, at the same time, in the same city, talking about this learned predecessor, this uh, Greek well-learned in the scriptures. And from these two different angles, they both converge on the... Uh, celestial hierarchy. So I think that's that's interesting, and that basically discredits Proclus. Specifically to Proclus, um, I don't know, Trey or Nate, if you wanted to jump in there before I address that. No, I no, want to say no, one no, thing because it, it relates to this. Because I think Evangelist gets into how what Proclus is doing is borrowing mostly from a few chapters in a single book of Dionysius, 
and uses that for his essentially his view of theodicy, right? He's not really interested in anything else Dionysius has to offer. It's just this view of theodicy. Um, and then in so doing, when you look at the exact lexical parallels that exist between them, you could find what um, Proclus is doing is essentially breaking the eternal parallelisms that exist in Dionysius. So he could kind of like shoehorn in his own point, which again would lend plausibility to him borrowing from Dionysius and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's common in text criticism. Parallelisms are, are evidence of integrity in a written source. But there's a point where um, Proclus discredits himself. And it's because, not that he's doing so intentionally, um, Proclus um, wasn't aware that there would be a future debate on Denisian authenticity. And then um, Proclus um, quotes um, as the gods of being flowers, superstantial lights, and everything like that, he says. And he elsewhere speaks of how the gods are super substantial, and as one has, has said, flowers and summits. So we can see both everything like that, as one has said, he's citing an external authority. And there's a very particular kind of uh, convergence of peculiar words, super substantial and flowers. And there's only one extant source which speaks of both of those words in the same breath, and that is Dionysius. Um, Dionysius uh, speaks of um, that the Father's fontal deity, but the Lord Jesus Christ um, and the spirit are, if one may so speak, God planted shoots and as it were flowers and superstantial lights of the God bearing deity. So there it is. Here's an extant source that we have that has all the words that Proclus himself says he got somewhere else. Now, there is the theoretical possibility that there is a third now lost source, which Proclus is actually borrowing from. And Dionysius borrowed, instead of from that law source, from Proclus, and that now preserves the Proclean dependence theory for pseudo-Dionysius. But it's worth pointing out, not only is this a more convoluted theory, a basic rule in text criticism is that you always go with the extant sources before you posit unknown sources. We have an extant source, it's Dionysius. We know that Proclus was citing a source that was extant in his day. What real reason do we have to posit an unknown source than just accept that Proclus was quoting Dionysius, just as all sorts of Alexandrian educated and uh, educated writers were doing the exact same thing, right? It allows us to just take the simplest explanation from what we see from evangels. We have people quoting Dionysius with the only excellent source they are speaking about is Dionysius and the lexical parables going to Alexandrian writings going all the way about to the year 200. Yeah, and um, it, it's not implausible that Proclus would have quoted from a Christian because he quotes from Origen by name four mm -hmm. times in his other treatises. Mm -hmm. And this has been defended on a very uh, high academic level by Ilaria Romelli, who is one of the leading scholars in the doctrine of apocatastasis and Origen. Um, and it seems that or, that uh, Proclus was very influenced by some uh, teachings of, of Origen and how he conceptualizes the return to the one, which, um, according to Romelli, was not um, expressed in that same way in, in Plotinus and earlier thinkers, but shows a dependence on, um, on Origen uh, towards uh, Proclus. Uh, these are the nitty-gritty of, of, of the debate, but essentially... On the page, we have Proclus quoting uh, some lost works of uh, yeah. philosophical works of origin. We have Eusebius, uh, who is a big fan of origin, who says in his history that the pagans quoted origin and he taught uh, in, the, in, in philosophical schools. So it's, it's really uh, not hard to believe. And then Proclus's own biographer, um, uh, Marinus, I believe. He, he says uh, that Proclus was a, um, a syncretist. He liked mixing things from different devotions and religions, you know? Mm. Uh, that's what he did. And you see that in his writings when he, where he mixes Platonism with uh, uh, Chaldean magic and these uh, Near Eastern traditions. Uh, so it, and, then, and then, of course, we have uh, Proclus himself in the famous treatise on the subsistence of evils. In the very beginning, he says, 
everything I'm going to be saying is just summaries of what my predecessors have said before me. So he, he admits that he's deriving this information from someone else. So you really have to believe in conspiracies to see Proclus saying that and then see the parallels of Dionysius and then try and, and turn the argument on their, on its head and say, no, actually, uh, Dionysius took it from, from Proclus. Uh, it's really not the, the, what the evidence, the, the clearest interpretation and the easiest interpretation. The simplest. It's the yeah, simplest. It, 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 Evangelos uh, made, I think, a very eloquent point on this that's simple, which is what is more likely that um, Dionysius, in writing a few chapters of a single book, scoured the entire corpus <laughs> of Proclus' writings and, you know, and slavishly borrowed terminology to write um, those few chapters or Proclus, when writing about theodicy, um, whenever he returns to the idea, just return to the one section of Dionysius' works he found compelling. Right. I mean, what's simpler? Someone had every book that there was this guy ever wrote from, you know, from his whole career in front of them so they could borrow from everywhere like this. Um, and by the way, not borrow the same way when they borrow from other writers, because right, we need right. that for the Pseudo-Denisian um, theory. Um, or simply, Proclus had one book in front of him, his greatest hit, you know, and said, I'm going to borrow from this book, and did it when it suited him, because that's the one book he cared about. I mean, obviously, that's easier. You know, right. it's, uh, again, that argument in of itself is not what proves everything, but I think that's a really kind of simple common sense argument, which makes sense of everything else we just said. Right. And, yeah. And and in, in the very fact that the the uh, um, ideas that Proclus is borrowing are novel to Neoplatonism, he's not expressing mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Neoplatonist position yeah. on evil. Yeah. He's expressing right. the Christian position on evil in, in that it's a a lack of being. It's a it's a, a deprivation of existence, not a substance mm -hmm. as Plotinus and the other. Uh, Neoplatonist going back, uh, or Middle Platonists going back to the first century had held. So he's hmm. breaking with tradition. He's telling you he's taking this from someone else. When he quotes exact uh, specific lex lexical passages, he says on two occasions, "I'm taking this from somewhere else." Uh, and you find all this in Dionysus. So it really, it doesn't. Hmm. Uh, you don't need to be a genius to to, to yeah. put one and one together. Well, and, yeah, and, and it's yeah. it's interesting. There's one thing for I forgot. It's there's this hyper focus that. Oh, the term parhypostasis is used by Proclus. Dionysius right. uses parhypostasis. The unsaid assumption is Christians are too stupid to use complicated terms, so therefore he borrowed it from Proclus, right? That's okay. kind of essentially the argument. But the term parhypostasis exists in Gregory of Nyssa. It's not original, uh, it's not original to um to Proclus. And so you not only have the concept of uh of uh evil being a, this like deprivation of good, which you see throughout Christian theology, it's in all sorts of writers, East and West, you have the actual, you know, philosophical term originating um, at its latest a hundred years before Proclus from a Christian writer, let alone if it actually existed before that with, uh, with Dionysius, which is right. obviously what we expound here. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a point you made, uh, uh, earlier about um how um how complicated the forgeries were or like how how complex they are as forgeries if they were forgeries um and how uh genius uh pseudo dionysius would have to be that um if you need to take that position in order to defend the inauthenticity thesis that seems to be inconsistent with the the basically word for word quotations of Proclus that they allege, because that's just a very obvious kind of giveaway that it, it's a forgery. Mm -hmm. So there's an inconsistency right right there as well. Um, uh, yeah, I was. Next question. Yeah, it's like what we're seeing here. It's, yeah. it's 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 not impossible that right. the pseudo uh, Dionysian uh, thesis is true, right? It mm -hmm. doesn't. It's not going to defy the laws of physics. Yeah. It's just that when you start putting all the evidence together, it just becomes less and less likely where mm -hmm. you wouldn't take it serious if we're any other author. It's just right. that it's become its own sacred tradition of secular theology mm -hmm. <laughs> that it has to be inauthentic. But the evidence from all sorts of different disciplines don't point to inauthenticity. They point to authenticity. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's and there's so much this really is a cumulative case. Um, and that's why the introduction is so long to the to the to the translation. Um, so we're not by any means covering everything. We just wanted to get to the um, get to touch all the bases. But this is sort of this this video is more just to point people to uh, to Craig's article if you want the breakdown of everything, not everything, but the the breakdown and then the actual introduction um, uh, in the translation for the for the developed uh, case, which is uh, a pretty, it's pretty cheap. So it's not like you're not, um, uh, you don't have to um, spend to too much house, money on this. $14. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's definitely worth it. Um, but I think, um, uh, well, this is the last question I, I, I think we, we have that we wanted to touch on. Um, but if there's anything else after this, uh, feel free to, to, to mention it guys. Um, but um, it, it's sort of this claim that Dionysius is, his theology is basically just uh, Neoplatonism with Christian terminology or a Christianized Neoplatonism. And um, if you read uh, Father Staniloy's essay, um, where he def defends the authenticity, he spends a, a lot of time breaking down the, the, the differences, like key doctrinal differences, uh, metaphysical differences between the Neoplatonic system um, and, and Dionysius. Now, it's hard because... It, it's difficult to even speak of a Neoplatonic system from what I understand. I mean, there's differences between the various authors, as you were saying, the uh, deprivation theory of evil. Um, that's, that's a later development in Neoplatonism, even though from what I remember, it basically is in Plato himself, um, at least, um, an early form of it. But um, in any case, um, what, I don't know if this, this is more of a theological question, so I'm not sure if that's, um, um, something you guys are, are fully comfortable talking about. I know I'm not just because I'm not, I know nothing about Neoplatonism really. Um, but uh, what, it, what what do we make of this claim that um, Dionysius is just a basically dressed up Neoplatonism? Um, and because, I mean, Maximus certainly didn't take him that way. Um, all the fathers who, who talk about him that people don't, um, we're not going to, um, uh, we wouldn't contest our, referring to the corpus, uh, whether you think it's inauthentic or not, later writers, they don't seem to take this view. It seems to be a modern view that um, this was a sort of corrupted version of of either Neoplatonism or Christianity, where it's just like a, a mixture of them or, or, or something. But Stanaloy mm -hmm. does a good job, from what I remember, it's been a while since I read the essay, pointing out the key doctrinal differences, which would basically make it... Um, um, disingenuous to to na uh, label him a Neoplatonist because there are key, even though there's diversity amongst the Neoplatonists, there are key Neoplatonic doctrines that would differentiate them from Christianity, uh, Orthodox Christianity. So, um, so yeah, what 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 would you guys say to to that claim? Um, yeah, I'm very glad you bring that up because people bandy this word around oh that's platonic that's neoplatonic but they really don't know what neoplatonism is right uh it's sort of you know a, this older school of protestants saying oh that's idolatrous idolatry right like it's just sort of a rhetorical word that's thrown around um what what is neoplatonism and what is dionysius's what does dionysius teach i think that's a good way to, mm -hmm. to show the differences so neoplatonism was a specific formulation uh, of the doctrines of, of Plato found in the dialogues that was formalized by Plotinus in the early third century. So these ideas existed before, but he really systematized it into a sort of theology. And uh, it could be summarized as follows. You have a Trinitarian God of, uh, of sorts. He calls it uh, the Trinity in Plotinus's um, the one, the intellect, and the soul, the world soul. So the one is sort of the source of being. It is above being. It is completely transcendent, unknowable. Uh, and this uh, comes from a, a verse in the Parmenides of Plato, where uh, Plato says that the one uh, neither is nor is one. So it, the, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of unity transcends yeah. unity. Um, and then this one will produce uh, from himself, from itself, um, in an act of self-contemplation, uh, what's called as the, the intellect, which is the, 
uh, the uh, space, the principle that contains all the ideas and principles of existence, uh, sort of the the forms or the ideas in the, in mm -hmm. the Platonic sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, it comes up in a sense in the Timaeus where uh, Plato talks about the demiurge who, who, who fashions the world after the, uh, after the forms. Uh, but this was systematized into a, um, a principle, theological principle by Plotinus. And then from the intellect, now not looking back towards the one, but looking out towards matter and the world, uh, he uh, begets a third hypostasis called the soul, which is uh, life and the animating principle of existence. So if you want to uh, think of it in Christian terms, uh, Plotinus, essentially, he's, a, he's an Arian because he believes that the, the, the Son is subordinate to the Father and the Holy Spirit to the Son. They're in a descending order of, mm -hmm. of essence. And uh, the world, ultimately, it's consubstantial with God. It's a, a yep. pantheistic view. So he's a pantheistic Arian, if you like. Uh, then we have Porphyry, who is a disciple of Plotinus. He seems to be, have been more of a modalist in that the one, uh, uh, the intellect and life, they're not three principles per se, but more different modes of being of the same entity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once we reach Proclus, there's um, a whole reimagining of the scheme that, that comes into play. So what Proclus did is he took the, the one, which was the first, the primary principle in Plotinus, and he separated it from the uh, the triad. So he says you have the one, which sort of like the essence of God is completely unknowable and transcendent. And then from this one, you have the uh, noetic triad of being, intellect, and life that, that um, emanates. But then there's a twist. What, what uh, Proclus did, following some um, earlier thinkers like uh, his, his master, Syrianus and uh, Iamblichus, is he introduced a completely novel middle layer called the henads. Mm -hmm. And the henads are, um, are uh, independent hypostases in which the one subsists fully. And in uh, these hypostases, uh, from these, you have being, life, and intellect that proceeds. And uh, you might wonder, well, what's the point of having this sort of intermediary layer that was introduced late in Neoplatonism. And the reason actually seems to be that um, in their debates with Christianity in, in late paganism, uh, the, the, uh, the pagans had, had sort of understood, they had abandoned the earlier conception of, the, uh, of polytheism and the, uh, the 12 gods of Olympus, right? They didn't actually mm -hmm. believe in these gods anymore. They had uh, started to believe in this more monotheistic platonic conception. So mm -hmm. in debates with Christians, it was very it was starting to get very hard to uh, defend their their traditional beliefs against the the Christian very, uh, very rigorous monotheist doctrine. So in the in the last attempt, uh, we can imagine uh, to to preserve the worship of the ancient gods, uh, what what Proclus and his uh, thinkers of that school did was to reimagine the ancient uh, ancient gods like Zeus, Apollo, and the others, and say, "Well, no, these things that are our traditional gods, they are actually uh, like avatars or hypostases of the one, the great, the great essence of of God, and this essence abides fully in these gods. So these these gods are really are really God. They're they're fully God." If you will, it's almost like they borrowed the, the Christian conception of the Holy Trinity, where each person is uh, in the independent hypostasis and yet fully God because it is fully of the same essence. And he applied yeah. that to the to uh, the, the 12 gods of Olympus and the other deities. Hmm. Um, OK, so that's Proclus' system. It's very complicated, very elaborate, right? Dionysius is nothing like that. All, all, all of Dionysius' system is basically... We have an essence of God that we cannot know as per Hellenistic Judaism and Exodus and all the early fathers. And then at the same time, this God is really present to us in the world and is known 
as life, peace, uh, goodness, wisdom, beauty, and all these names and manifestations uh, in which he appears in the Old Testament, which Dionysius, uh, that's where he gets his list of divine names from, just like um, St. Irenaeus. And um, so there's there's no notion of this middle uh, hierarchy of, of Henans, this completely superfluous hierarchy. Uh, you have God being both fully transcendent and immanent. Mm -hmm. And then uh, th there's no chain of emanation in which God is more present in being, let's say, and less mm -hmm. present in life or more present in wisdom and less in peace. All these energies or uh, uh, powers or graces of God are all equally God, but in different uh, in different ways. So it, it's really, it's, it's crazy to, to think you could take something as complicated and, and specific as Proclus, uh, drain it of everything that makes it specifically Proclean, and then recast it as something that you could have derived from the scriptures in the first place, and then say that's where Dionysius took it. Like, there's there's no element in Proclus that is dependent on Dionysius. Although you could argue that uh, Proclus's conceptualization of the Henans are influenced by, by Christianity, since this is a late development in the, in the uh, um, Neoplatonic school. But anyways, that was right. very complicated long, but I'll, yeah. I'll let that yeah. be. And I'll say very simply, because I'm not that smart as what we just heard. Um, so it takes me back to my college days learning about emanationism, that uh, what's the motive for forgery, like you said, to, to take stuff from Proclus and then just drain it from everything that's this distinctly Neoplatonic and then import everything that's authentically first and second century Christian anyway. Yeah. What is the motive? Now, to do all this, just to make, let's say, a monophysite, a heretical view sound authentic and intelligent that can make sense but as we already kind of elaborated upon that really didn't even occur everyone looked at Dionysius as teaching their doctrine and the the actual Dionysian writings themselves seem not to be too concerned at that later debate to otherwise it would have been more explicit weighing in on one side or the other I mean of course we as Chalcedonian Eastern Orthodox Christians um think he agrees with us but you know that kind of proves the point though that Dionysius was writing these ideas um, to address um, debates of his time. And so for there to be a so Dionysius, we have now an unknowable motive that can't be perceived. And to make the accusation something's a forgery. In any criminal case, um, to convict someone of a crime, you need to prove motive. Crimes don't just happen like randomly, you know? So like you have to prove a motive. We don't have a motive here. Um, we have motives that make sense in the first, second century, but we don't have a motive that makes sense for inauthenticity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, and, and something Evangelo said, um, or I mean, I guess uh, maybe also to sort of condense as well what Evangelo said, I think there's two distinct, like the two distinctive um, differences between um, D Dionysius and, and Christianity and Neoplatonism is actually our two um, most basic doctrines, the Trinity and the Incarnation. Because on the one hand, you have this conception of the Trinity and the Neoplatonists where you have a problem, and this is really the eternal uh, Platonism problem. Um, if you watch this video by a big YouTuber named Keith Woods, big philosophy YouTuber, he's really into, into Platonism, he ends the video by saying we have a problem with uh, the how we don't get a reduction of creation or what we call creation to God in the Neoplatonic system. Um, because if everything is just like, it's just this flow, this emanation from the one, then at what point do you have what I think for really to have a coherent theology, ultimately, you need to have this strict division, this sub difference of substance between um, uncreated and, and created, which you you don't necessarily have in the Neoplatonists. And there's there's differences. I think Plotinus is more on the side of like a sort of universal consubstantiality, whatever you want to call it. Um, but um, yeah, so then there's that problem. And then at the same time, it's difficult from a Neoplatonic perspective to conceive of something as radical as the incarnation as the union of uh the unconfused union of created and uncreated nature in a single hypostasis um this you also don't have in neoplatonism so on the one hand you have a problem of reducing the one to to the world and then it seems like sort of a parallel problem is 
precisely the opposite. How can you have a true union of of the one in 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 the many or the one in in creation? And um and and yeah, this is like this this really is reflected in be, because this is like the two foundational dogmas of Christianity and um is really central the their conception of 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 at least the Trinity is really essentially Neoplatonism. It has an effect on their whole understanding of of the world um like one one example is in this neoplatonic understanding of henosis versus uh, our equivalent would be theosis um with henosis you have a hard time um and some some will just like some monists will neoplatonic monists will just affirm this uh where you just lose your individuality you lose your distinctiveness mm -hmm. um which to me sounds a lot less like salvation and more like some sort of damnation some sort of horrible horrible um fate for all of us where basically every every one we've ever known uh loved and experienced and and had had relations with uh relationships with um and and formed bonds um that is predicated upon our distinct our distinction uh i am one i am a hypostasis you're a hypostasis you're a person i'm a person we can talk and know each other and that's um, and this structure, as we know, um, goes all the way up to the Trinity, to the Trinity itself. Um, and yeah, so you just see this, this philosophical problem with specifically this idea of phenosis, where it's basically you're absorbed back into the one. That's kind of a, uh, it's more complicated than that. And there's different perspectives on it. But I think the point is, um, there, the, basically the argument that Dionysius was basically just a neo- uh, Platonist writer just doesn't make sense because um, one he doesn't have the essentials of he actually he he essentially lines up with with Christianity and affirms the Trinity and and the the incarnation um, and he doesn't have this understanding of uh, an all this extra baggage of the Neoplatonic system which if he was trying to do some sort of synthesis of neoplatonism in christianity you think he would have brought more of the actual neoplatonic mm -hmm. stuff into a system instead of 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 just having these parallels which as we've talked about in this in this uh call actually the most simple explanation is is to to see the neoplatonists as influenced by by him in some way uh, other than the, uh, vice versa um but yeah I, I, that's basically all of our questions was there anything essential uh to this debate do you, do you think that we missed i will bring up some internal historical details that we could find in Nicene corpus that um pre-nicene um that so we could help situate um whether or not there's anachronisms within the text which i think are relevant so like uh Denisius makes reference to there being church buildings and the popular idea is oh everything was a house church you know people meeting in the living room which is itself is a sort of anachronism but, you know, Eusebius and Clement of Alexandria speak of church buildings. Um, Denisius speaks of altars. St. Ignatius speaks of altars. Um, St. Denisius speaks of the sign of the cross, Tertullian. And in fact, in Pompeii, we have preserved crosses. So we know the sign of the cross existed. In fact, the earliest one is a tenant square, the words tenant and a cross, which is dated to at least before 62 AD. Um, there's a book called Crosses of Pompeii. If people want to see every picture of a cross that's been um, unearthed in Pompeii, but the cross is very solidly proven in archaeology to be from at least the first century. I think the the, the hotter take will be, well, did the cross exist in Judaism? Was there something uh, within Judaism that was um, uh, messianic and uh, connected later to Christianity? That's hmm. A question archaeologists could argue, but it's kind of irrelevant our purposes. The point is, sign the cross Denisius, and we have crosses from the first century. Um, godparents are in Denisius. St. Hippolytus talks about godparents. Um, renunciation of Satan before baptisms talked about by Nicias. St. Hippolytus talks about the renunciation of Satan in baptism. The bapti baptism of children is an origin in Cyprian. Denisius talks about the baptism of children. Chrismation is talked about by Theophilus of Antioch and Tertullian. Denisius talks about chrismation of uh, uh, chrismation after baptism. Um, prayers for the dead are in Second Timothy, Tertullian, and Cyprian. They're also in Denisius. Uh, minor orders in the church, uh, Denisius and Hippolytus. Particular hypostasis doctrine. No, this is not just from the fourth century. Um, Origen uses the same exact terminology to the same effect. And conceptually, it's in St. Hippolytus. And uh, obviously, both concept and uh, word is in Denisius. Um, Chalcedonian terminology, for example, without change, um, 
Musimaya. And without confusion, it's a certain the Greek that's a single word. It's found in Hippolytus and even Philo. So this is not something you had to get from Chalcedon. This is there's stuff from the first and uh, second, third century with this terminology. Uh, we already talked about energy essence distinction and and stuff like that, but also other like eternal historical details in the text. Um, if this is a forgery, why is he called St. Timothy deaf to what he's writing? Right. Yeah. Right. It's sort of that. like yeah. if you're making a forgery, you're trying to convince people to forgery for some unknown motive that none of us could establish. Yeah. And then you're cutting yourself at the knees by, you know, calling the other apostles in dispute because the whole point of making an apostolic forgery is to cloak the authority of the writer with the mm -hmm. apostolic authority. Mm -hmm. How do you accomplish that criticizing other apostles? It only makes sense if these guys were your colleagues and you, you spoke to them as your colleagues, right? That makes sense. The yeah. forgery hypothesis makes no sense in light of this mm -hmm. eternal detail. Um, another and interesting his master, one is... His master here, Rotheos, right? He introduces yes. this figure in... Uh, the divine name saying my master Herotheos was my great teacher after St. Paul and he quotes him and he gets all these doctrines from him. He's nowhere attested in the New Testament. So if you're forging a writing, trying to convince people of uh, apostolic authority, why would you introduce a figure, a mysterious figure that's nowhere attested in, in the New Testament or elsewhere, and then say you got this doctrine from him? Why wouldn't you just say, oh, as uh, St. Paul taught me at the uh, Areopagus, right? It's uh, yeah. it so points to to natural <laughs> yeah it's it's more naturalistic but it's it's mm -hmm. less obvious mm -hmm. yeah it's uh, another interesting detail which doesn't get talked about a lot is that Hippolytus um, saying uh, Denisius speaks about being at Heliopolis during the crucifixion where he uh, sees the eclipse now this there's two things that dovetail from this one is it implies his old age when writing it so you sort of now created this sort of unnecessary problem by adding this fake detail, if it's, we're presuming upon it being fake, where he'd have to be like late 80s at the very earliest um, and probably 90s uh, writing this. And, and so it's like, why add this detail? But also it adds another subtle detail, which was the eclipse was calculated. Heliopolis was used for um, solar calculations. That was the point of being there. And it would have made sense someone who was studying Alexandria might go to Heliopolis to um, study the, the sun. And so it shows you that the eclipse that occurred during the crucifixion was at least something, maybe not its duration, which was a miracle, but it happening on that day was calculated, which is why he decided to be there. It's right. a very precise like scientific detail where someone who was not really concerned with the sciences, we, we just not leave it because they just take for granted the eclipse was a miracle. Mm -hmm. But if you are really there alive at the time, really as astute and well-learned as someone like Denisius, um, it would make sense. You might be in Heliopolis because they were doing calculations of when eclipses were occurring mm -hmm. and where mm -hmm. they were occurring in those days. So it's a very interesting detail that lends a sort of scientific authenticity where it would give skeptics the reason to believe, oh, it was just a natural eclipse and the gospel writers exaggerated or whatever, right? But right. if you're just actually there for that reason, you would think nothing of the detail. So it's it's a very interesting, um, scientifically accurate detail that is in the text. Right, yeah. So I think Craig just listed off like 10 different points in a very short time span. So that just goes to show that there is a lot more to be said on this topic um and as i said before um the most detailed explanation or overview of all the evidence is in the introduction to the new translation of of uh the life of saint dionysius and um it's scriptor scriptorum press is that it scriptorium press yeah right yeah, right yeah we're on uh, we have a website scriptoriumpress.ca mm -hmm. and uh, we're also active on twitter people could follow us there right right yeah so the link to the website and the book will be in the description um but yeah i thought this was a, a very good conversation very essential conversation to be happening uh aligns a lot with the stuff we talk about on this channel philosophy and um and uh theology and stuff and uh, I, I think, would, would Dionysius be the first, could we say he's the first Christian philosopher? The, the I, I think? Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So I think I'll make that part of the title of this video, the first Christian philosopher. Um, yeah. So anyways, thank you guys so much. I, I appreciate your time and, uh, and all the insights and all the truth bombs. I'm sure my audience will, will really enjoy this one. And again, uh, consider getting the book linked in the, in the description. Um, and I'll also put Craig's article in, in the description as well, because that's what I sort of had almost an existential moment reading this stuff on Proclus. I'm like, just everything changes after this. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks again, guys. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.